tonight. Could you live in a 35 square foot dumpster for a year? Also, Chiebert comes on to talk a little bit about net neutrality. It's coming up next on Padres Corner. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Padres Corner is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Padres Corner, episode 26, recorded February 7th, 2015, for February 24th, 2015. Net neutral honesty. Welcome to Padres Corner. It's the Twitch show where we put you into the mind of a Jesuit priest. And see if you come out sane on the other side. I'm Father Robert Ballasare, the digital Jesuit. Padre SJ in the Twit TV chat room. Leo and Lisa decided that we needed a show that could cover some of the topics that fall through the cracks here at Twit TV. Something that maybe wasn't really newsy, maybe something that didn't really fit into any of our shows, but was still important to geeks. And that's where Padre's Corner comes into play. Now, as always, we're going to start our show off with something a little bit offbeat. Some of you may remember when I talked about the professor who was going to live in a dumpster. His name was Professor Jeff Wilson. He's the dean of Houston Tillotson University College in Austin, Texas. He's a, he's a very distinguished man. He holds a Ph.D. in environmental science from the University of Canterbury. He's a respected associate professor of biological sciences. He's a recipient of one of the most competitive teaching honors in the United States, the Regents Outstanding Award. And he's received funding from the NSF, from Ford Motor Company, Home Depot. And the, he's on the forefront of research into curriculum and sustainability. Well, we brought him up because he had a very interesting project. He wanted to find out what's the smallest amount of space that we in modern contemporary society could live in. Oh, many of us live in houses that are 24, 2,500 square feet. In fact, that's the average in the United States. Not it's, that's not even a Mac, Mac Mansion. And along with all that space comes all the stuff that we've accumulated. In fact, so many of us have accumulated enough stuff to need another house or a storage unit or someplace else to park our junk. Well, the professor here decided that he was going to live in this. This is a dumpster that has 35 square feet of space. Now, of course, he, he didn't just move into a smelly old dumpster. It was actually cleaned out. It was purpose made for him. It was, it was repurposed for, for everything he needed for, for his contemporary life. He wanted a low-impact, zero-net-waste dwelling that would have, well, basically a negligible impact on the planet. Oh, here's a rundown of what he had and didn't have. He had 33 square feet of living space. He had a bed. He had four pairs of pants. He had four shirts, three pairs of shoes, three hats, nine bow ties, and everything was stored in a false floor with some cooking equipment that was designed for camping. He didn't have a shower, a sink, or a toilet. He used the facilities at the university. He didn't have a washer or a dryer. He didn't have a closet, a desk, running water, or even insulation. Now, since we talked about this story last year, he added solar panels, an electrical hookup, air conditioning, because, well, in the summer, it can be absolutely brutal. And after a year, he is now walking out. That's right. On the anniversary of simply living in a dumpster, the good professor is ready to move on to the next part of his academic career. Now, most of us would never think about moving into such a small house. And there's good reason for that. We have a fundamental desire to be self-sufficient. In fact, it's it's not just a desire to, to have our stuff. It's a desire to not need someone else's help when we get into trouble. It's part, not just of our human nature, but of our national ethos. You've heard it before. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Do it yourself. Don't take that helping hand. Don't take that hand out. Well, there are now some people who are wondering if that's the right way to go, if that's the right lessons to be ingraining into the minds of the younger generations. Think about the message that we're sending out. Never need help. Never need a helping hand. Never need your neighbors. Never be vulnerable. Never be without. And it's only when you can do those things that you're successful. 
what the dumpster house did was to turn a lot of those assumptions on their head. It was to take them and say, well, do I always need everything that I will ever need in my entire life? Do I need to be completely isolated from my neighbor? Do I always need to feel shame if I need a helping hand? Do I have to be ashamed to need my friends? Well, maybe not. There are a lot of things to say that uh, people have already said about this man. They've said that he's an academic who doesn't really understand how to live in the world. People have said that he's a dreamer, that no one could ever actually live in a 35-square-foot house. There are people who said that he's a communist, he's a socialist, he's a bad man because he's trying to make us feel bad about the things that we've accumulated. But I think there's something more important at play here, and that is to make us all question what we could do without. What would we absolutely need would be the bare minimum for us to live the way that we want to live? What are the things, in other words, that are actually important to us? The question, especially for this new generation, is, which is more connected than any previous generation, is if we're always on the go, if we're always connected, if we do believe that we are now social people, why are we still living in houses that are McMansion antisocial? Perhaps we're ready to move into a society that values connections rather than independence. Now, when we come back, I want to have a nice discussion about net neutrality. Now, now I, know, I know what you're saying. Not again. Or some of you are groaning. Some of you are saying, oh, it's going to turn into a screen fest. It's not going to be like that. This is not a rant. I don't want to rant about net neutrality. I want to actually have an educational talk about what it means, where it came from, and what's the history of the internet that net neutrality is now trying to affect. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take some time to take a look at the tech. Speaking of sustainability, I have a product here that a lot of people have hated on, which is why I'm playing it, because that's just the way I am. If you did think about going camping or carrying only the gear that you needed to survive, and you wanted something that could generate a little power on the side, then maybe what you need is some power pot. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the Digital Jesuit, and I'm taking a look at some geeky camping gear from Power Practical. Meet the Power Pot 5, and you'll never guess what this nuclear bomb looking device does. Actually, you probably will because it does what it's named after. It's a pot for cooking that provides power. But how it provides that power is what's so geek tastic. The Power Pot looks like a standard, well made 1.4 liter camping pot. It uses a two piece design with the lid doubling as a bowl to scoop in whatever you might be cooking. Heat resistant wire handles fold flat against both the pot and the bowl, flipping out to give you hot carry capabilities. In use, the Power Pot is actually a damn good camping pot. The small size and 18 ounce weight is perfect for a pack, and it's durable. Very durable. In fact, with somewhat careful usage and storage for three months, I barely put any scratches into the hard anodized aluminum surface. What makes the Power Pot not just another well made camping utensil? is the thermoelectric generator and heat spreader built into the base of the pot. A thermoelectric generator, or TEG, is a device that converts heat energy into electrical energy. Not too long ago, I reviewed another thermoelectric generator, the BioLite Camp Stove, and it was brilliant because it allowed campers and outdoors folks to efficiently burn just about any slightly flammable material while converting some of that heat into electrical energy that both charged an internal battery and powered whatever USB device you might connect to the stove. The power pot works much the same way as the BioLite stove, converting heat into electricity. But while the BioLite stove had a blower, a combustion chamber, batteries, and support members, the power pot is a solid state device with no moving parts. All TEGs work the same in that there's a hot side and a cold side. When heat moves from the hot side to the cold side, you generate electricity. Now, the trick is to keep the cold side cold. You need some sort of process to, to maintain that cold state, which means you need to draw the thermal energy away. If you don't, the two surfaces become the same temperature, and then... Actually, it, it just stops generating electricity. But if you let that heat continue, eventually, you'll destroy the generator. 
The BioLight stove uses its electric fan to make sure that the cold side stays the requisite number of degrees below the hot side. But without any moving parts, the trick to the power pot is that it uses whatever you're cooking as coolant. Okay, that's enough of the theory. I'm sure there are people out there asking, that sounds all good, but how well does it charge? Well, the answer in six words is, it depends on what you eat. At full tilt, the power pot can supply between 0.5 and 1 amp of 5 volt USB power, enough to charge my Galaxy S4 with about 4 hours of decent fire. However, since your food is the coolant, and since the amount of power that the power pot puts out depends on how much thermal energy transfers from the hot side to the cold side, the amount of power that the power pot can provide depends on what it's heating. The power pot is designed for straight water. Boiling water is perfect for generating power because the steam carries away much of the heat, always keeping the cool side cool, letting you charge faster and longer. In fact, you must boil water to make the power pot charge properly. When I tried cooking kare kare, one of my favorite Filipino dishes, I realized that I was about to destroy my power pot because the high heat retention of the dish eventually made the temperature differential between the hot and cool side too small to generate power. Also, but seriously, without water, you'll destroy your power pot. The Power Pot 5 is available now. You can find it online for about $150. Let's start with the pros. And the first pro has to be the durability. This black anodized surface is really good at warding off bumps and scratches. In fact, this is perfect for a pack, for something that needs to be ready to go, something that needs to be ready to be used in the outdoors. In the months of usage, I, I see a little bit of wear, but most of the major dents have been avoided because of the construction of the device. The other thing, and let's be honest about this, is that it's just cool. It's cool to be able to generate power out of fire. I mean, we all like to have a device that in, in case of emergency or just in case of camping, we can charge the devices that we want to keep charged with just a little bit of elemental fire. On the con side, I'd have to say the first thing is price. $150 actually is a lot, even for a well-made camping pot. The other thing is that, uh, well, in order for this to work properly, you have to be boiling water. Now, I have use it as a double boiler so that I can boil something else. Or I, I've, I've gotten into the habit of boiling water and then pouring the water into the boil, into the bowl. But the other thing is that you need to keep some water at the bottom, otherwise you, you will destroy the thermoelectric generator. That it's, it's just a bit fragile at times, and I worry about that. Still, considering all those pros and all those cons, if I had to give the power pot from Power Practical a buy, try, or don't buy, the geek inside of me says it's an absolute buy. I'm Father Robert Ballas here with Before You Buy. Now, interestingly enough, the technology that we talked about on last week's Padres Corner, when we were talking about the uh, the mission to Pluto, the, the dwarf planet, uses a lot of the same technology. They use plutonium-238 oxide to create heat that just gets vented out into space. That's an RTG, a radio isotope thermoelectric generator. It uses the same technology, except they're not using it to cook food. Oh well. Hey, if you need a way to generate power while you're camping, take a look at the power pot. Now, this is my favorite time of the show. This is when I get to bring a guest on to talk about some of the issues that I think are important to the people who are important to me. Now, this time we want to speak about net neutrality. And as I said before, I don't want this to become a shouting match. I don't want this to become a hate on every vendor, blah, 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 blah talk. But rather, let's go over some of the issues that are behind net neutrality, behind the Internet, behind the history of how we got to where we are today. And so I could think of no better person to talk about this than my good friend and my co-host from This Week in Enterprise Tech, Mr. Brian Chi. Chi. Thank you very much for coming on. Hey, Padre. <laughs> Why are you so relaxed? I don't understand this. I'm at home, man. Oh, okay. Hey, and when, it, when you start talking about RTGs, I could only think about the book you introduced me to, The Martian. Uh, actually, yes. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a new generation of people who know about radioisotope thermoelectric generators because they read or they listened to the Martian. It's a, it's a fantastic book. If you haven't read it yet, and again, we're not advertising for them. We don't get paid by Audible or by Kindle or Amazon anywhere. Pick up a copy. It's going to reignite your passion for space exploration. Yep. 
Yeah. Extreme botany. Extreme botany. Chibert, I brought you on today because I, <laughs> I wanted to get your input on some of the things that we need to know when we talk about net neutrality. Net neutrality has become such a charged term in today's world. Some people are saying that the FCC is, they're being communists. They're trying to take away stuff that companies have paid for. You, you've got others who are saying they're acting too slow. You've got others who are saying that they're not going far enough. And that's just words. That's just angry words going back and forth. And I understand that people have to have that. It's, it's cathartic. But it's better if people were actually educated about how the internet came to be the way it is today. So could I call upon your encyclopedic knowledge and, and ask you the first question, which is, how does the internet work? Let's start with that basic bit so that people get what makes the internet the internet. Uh, in its most basic form, the internet really started off by people just doing point-to-point -point connections between different machines. Now, it doesn't make sense for, say, if you if you in Honolulu want to go and talk to someone in San Francisco, it doesn't make sense for you to take the connection that goes to Washington, D.C. first and then comes back to San Francisco. So routing protocols were created that allow you to go and say, hey, there's a there's a better way of doing it. It might only be one hop to Washington, D.C. and then one hop back, but maybe taking three hops to get to San Francisco is better because it's a shorter distance, lower latency, and so forth. So internet routing is actually a combination of not only how many hops to get someplace, but also what kind of cost does it have? <clears throat> now, if we're going to start talking about net neutrality, we have to start talking about that. <clears throat> so the reality is, is a lot of the internet routing that happens, like, like for instance, let, what a lot of people don't understand is that, say for instance, I'm in Honolulu, and I have so, a 3G modem that needs to talk to a server in Honolulu. The reality is, is depending on your carrier, my data that goes from Kihei Maui from my power monitoring systems actually jumps on to the T-Mobile network and goes all the way to Dallas-Fort Worth before it comes back to Hawaii. And that's because we have this thing called peering. And the crossover, the agreement, that is set up between T-Mobile and their other carriers, say, for instance, uh, some big backbone carriers like CenturyLink or T-Mobile or whoever, um, their default, their knee-jerk reaction is they set up the peering, the crossover in Dallas-Fort Worth. However, one of the things that you can do, this is for those that have, say, an enterprise that you need this, I'm going to actually set up a crossover point at the Hawaii Internet Exchange. We'll, we'll actually talk a little bit more about that when we um, go forward a little bit. But the idea is I'm going to set it up so that my 3G modems can stay, keep their data in Hawaii, which would actually cut down as much as two to three seconds off a round trip for a packet that goes between Kihei Maui and Honolulu, Hawaii, to the University of Hawaii. So it's all about agreements. So, for instance, if you're in the um, San Francisco area and you want to talk to your 10,000-seat enterprise, say you're VPNing back into your corporation, um, you're going from your local ISP, say in your home, and it's going to go until it hits the peering point. Where is the crossover? So say, for instance, if you're um, like me and I'm on Oceanic Time Warner, which is Time Warner, and I need to cross over to the University of Hawaii, say, for instance, it's on um, Sprint. Where is the agreement where TW Telecom or Oceanic has their crossover point with the carrier for the University of Hawaii? Well, in the case of the University of Hawaii and Hawaii, we're actually really, really lucky. Very early on, the University of Hawaii and the powers that be actually set up a thing called an Internet Exchange Point. We call it HICS, the Hawaii Internet Exchange. <clears throat> it happens to sit in a big, giant co-location facility called DR Fortress down by the Honolulu Airport. 
And it is a place where the University of Hawaii, government agencies, schools, and so forth can have a crossover. So in the old days, say, for instance, I had to go and transfer something from a K-12 school to the University of Hawaii or vice versa, sometimes the crossover would be all the way in Chicago before it would come back to Hawaii. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. By creating the peering location, now it doesn't go as far, it only goes as far as the airport where it crosses over between internet domains. Keep put a pin in that. That's going to be an important term as we start talking about exchange points and how companies get paid and so forth. So we have that peering point, the exchange point, the BGP boundary, the Boundary Gateway Protocol, which is an internet routing protocol. Okay, so let's define that. There are intranet routing protocols that you would have, say, inside your corporation that might be things like RIP or OSPF and so forth. Then there are internet routing protocols like Boundary Gateway Protocol where it's how you advertise that I'm hawaii.edu or I'm twit.tv, and so forth and so on. So when we really get down to it, <clears throat> unfortunately, a lot of this is all about internet relationships or human relationships. The best router geeks in the world that I've gotten to meet are actually the ones <clears throat> that know a lot of other router geeks. They have their telephone numbers. They have the knock on speed dial. They're saying, hey, what kind of... Uh, agreements do you have set up so that we can go and fix things? So, Padre, why don't we go back and have this have this conversation about peering and how peering is actually just comparing two numbers, and those two numbers are GP, BGP peering numbers. Yeah, you know, uh, so, one of the one of the vital components here is that uh, when we look at the internet. You can't consider it as a, a single network. There are still some people out there who, either, you know, they're hearing about this net neutrality thing for the first time. They think that, oh, well, someone owns the Internet. And so, uh, you know, when they own the Internet, they should be able to derive as much profit from it as they can. But we know that all of these technologies, BGP and the idea of peering and the idea of these arrangements in which these companies will, will allow bits to flow back and forth over their networks are because the internet is fragmented into so many different pieces, all owned by different entities and all doing their own thing. There are companies that own just one length of fiber going between two cities. There are other companies that will own fiber going across oceans. There are other, other companies that all they do is they do the last mile. But in order for your, your bit of information, for that email that you're sending to go from your phone to someone else's phone in Russia, it could go through 5, 10, 15 different companies before it actually gets there. And, and that's one of those things that I think many don't still understand about how the Internet works. Yeah, actually, just do a trace route sometime. Uh, on a Windows machine, it's T-R-A-C-E-R-T. On a Mac or a Linux machine, it's T-R-A-C-E-R-O-U-T-E, -E -E, space, and then what you want to talk to. And you'll notice all these little hops that your packets have to take in. So each one of those hops represents a node along the way. And you'll notice as it looks up the DNS names that they're going to start changing. So when we start talking about exchange points, those might be in co-location facilities that might be in a central office someplace. They, they, they happen all over the place. I've even heard of a crossover point sitting in a brick, a hollow tile um, brick house that was sitting next to a set of train tracks. And it all it had was a window air conditioner just to keep the gear cool. But it was a fairly major crossover point. So... What happens is every time we change between carriers, so say, for instance, I'm trying to get from Honolulu to San Francisco. So the connection that I'm doing from my home into the, the brick house. Well, first off, I'm on tele, Time Warner Telecom, which then hop, actually Oceanic Cable Vision, which is the Roadrunner carrier, actually has a crossover over into TW Telecom, which is actually a separate corporation. And when they transfer it, they're actually paying 
what are called transit fees. So your monthly actually goes in part to paying transit fees. It also goes into keeping up the equipment. So from TW Telecom, it crosses the ocean. <clears throat> and actually, TW Telecom doesn't own the fiber in this case. They're probably buying um, bandwidth from someone like CenturyLink or AT&T or something like that. Yet another transit fee, which then hits San Francisco, crosses over to yet another ISP that might carry it over. And then along the line and six or seven or eight or ten transit fees later, um, I finally get to the brick house. <clears throat> so that's how the big boys care, um, make money. And Internet carriers are classified. There's tier one, tier two, and tier three. The tier one carriers are the big national carriers. So if you ever bring up, say, like, for instance, a transoceanic uh, fiber map, those are typically only owned by tier one carriers. Those things are hugely expensive, and they, they're the ones that cross between continents. They're the ones that cross into different states. Then there's the tier two. Once it gets to a state, how do you distribute it out within a state? Those, that's probably going to be a tier two carrier. The final carrier that does the last mile into your home is called a tier three. The unfortunate fact of life is tier three carriers tend to have the heaviest load on transit fees because they're the ones that have the end users. The end users are the ones generating the requests. So the poor tier three transit uh, ISPs tend to get hit by the largest number of transit fees. Um, video is a huge one. And that's the reason why um, the big carriers don't like people like Netflix. Netflix doesn't pay the vast majority of the um, uh, transit fees because they send it out, it hits tier, you know, it goes up to the tier one. Most of Netflix is a directly connected in a tier one um, peering location. And then it heads out, it hits the tier two and then tier three. And unfortunately or fortunately, it's the poor tier threes that have this giant deluge of video coming in and they unfortunately pay the vast majority. So it's a little lopsided and that's the reason why um, there's been a lot of the... Um, Tier, you know, the different ISPs have fought net neutrality is because they're getting extra money. They're trying to get extra money from people like Netflix, people like, you know, the streaming video people, where they can make a little bit of extra money because they're getting socked by transit fees. Right. But Chibert, see, this is the thing that, that I think confuses even people who know a little bit about <clears throat> how these networks work, which is if we're paying, so we're paying our ISP, and Netflix is paying to get onto the network wherever they're connecting. Those fees are supposed to be distributed according to how much traffic is flowing over these networks, right? I mean, that's that's what we pay for. So where where is the fault? Where are, where is the system failing so that the companies and the peering agents that should be getting paid aren't getting paid? You know, I I don't have first hand. Uh, this would be something that you'd have to ask for someone ask of someone that works at say a tier one and realistically they have to ask someone that works in sales for a tier one and most of the tier one vendors aren't going to fess up i would my speculation on this a lot of it's because you have sweetheart deals you have special agreements for prioritizing traffic i'm going to give one vendor, say Netflix, a little bit better deal um, than the guy down the street because we've got a business relationship. I'm going to give them maybe a slightly higher priority. There's a lot of the extra money that vendor, the internet service providers make is on relationships. It The fees that we pay, because it's so competitive, I don't think the tier three ISPs actually even break even. I think there's so much discounting happening that, and you know, the cost of the modems and upgrades and so forth. I don't think they make money there. I think they make the money on ads. I think they make the money on special deals. And 
Unfortunately, the downside to net neutrality forcing them to eat level the playing field and forcing possibly forcing them to not be able to make these special deals is I think it's going to cut into the, the amount of profits these uh, smaller ISPs can make. And I think we're going to actually start seeing more and more consolidation and, you know, double-edged sword. I like the concept of net neutrality. Um, you know, it's a knee-jerk reaction, but I feel bad for the ISPs that need those special relationships to actually turn a profit. Right, right. I, we actually had a guest on one of our shows not too long ago who was, he, he runs his own ISP, and he was saying in, in no uncertain terms, if Title II is used, I will go out of business. I cannot make enough money to be able to serve my customers the service that I've been advertising if if they're going to make me be completely transparent about, as you said, the sweetheart deals that I've cut. And I get that. And, uh, you know, I, I don't like to see any company go out of, the, out of business. But at the same time, I'm thinking, well, why is that my problem? If, if you've created a business model that is not sustainable, if you are doing business in a way it, that should not be allowed, that, that shouldn't be be successful because you are counting on those sweetheart deals because you are counting on the ability to manipulate the system towards your benefit then i don't have a whole lot of sympathy for you uh you know and, and, and again that's it's being really crass and it's being incredibly simplistic but i do have that sense that that's that's behind a lot of this push for title two so many of us have said the same thing which is we don't want title two the, the 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 geeks don't want to see Title II being backhanded across the industry, but the industry has been behaving so poorly for the last twenty years that it's kind of the last bullet in the chamber. Yeah, well, hey, I when people start complaining about this, I I, I go and say, hey, how much did your mobile phone cost you? I'll bet you. You probably didn't pay six, seven, eight, nine hundred dollars, thousand dollars for your phone because it's subsidized. Now, what's going to probably happen is if Title II happens and the especially the tier three ISPs start getting pissed off about this, your cable modem or DSL modem is probably not going to be subsidized anymore. So that means you're going to be hit by the full rental charge, not a subsidized rental charge, or you're going to be forced to buy your modem and you and the rent or the rental charge is going to be really high. So, yeah, I, I've always been sitting on the fence because I've seen the other side. It is really, really, really expensive to do last mile. And while net neutrality sounds great and I, I support the concepts, I feel bad for the consumer because the bottom line is the consumer is going to take it in the pocketbook because the last mile guys can't play the subsidized game quite the same way anymore. And yeah, maybe this was an unsustainable business model, but the market drove it there. Ah, but and no, Cheever, wait yeah, a minute. Go ahead. Hold on. Using using the subsidized phone model, uh, more more and more people are moving to buying their phone unsubsidized. I haven't bought a subsidized phone probably in the last eight years because I've I did the math and I said, wait a minute. At the end of a two year or three year contract, I'll have actually paid a hundred percent more for the subsidized phone than I would if I just bought it outright and then got service, uh, and. That's actually a market force as well. T-Mobile started doing it, and then it's now yep. it's affecting the other carriers. The other carriers are starting to see that a subsidization a subsidization model isn't gonna cut it anymore. People are getting much yep. more savvy about where they put their money. Yeah, and let me flip the coin around a little bit. There is an awful lot of people that are going out and buying their own uh, Doxis cable modems. Actually, one of my students just bought one, and he's getting absolutely superb speeds out of it um, and very, very happy. And it wasn't horribly expensive. Um, it's a double-edged sword. you got to look at both sides. Um, if the market stabilizes, fantastic. But will the market stabilize? That's a whole big wait-and-see ball of wax. 
Right. One of the the stories that I like to bring up, I, I use most of the time when I'm talking about net net neutrality because it is such a sore spot for me. Was the two hundred billion dollars that was basically gifted to the uh, to the telecommunications industry after the Telecommunications Act, and it was it was given to them in the forms of, of tax relief and fees that they were allowed to charge their customers in exchange for the next generation broadband internet, which was supposed to deliver 45 megabits per second to, what was it, like 30 million houses in the United States. They didn't do it. They took the money. They never delivered the network. They, they delivered 1 megabit per second, 1.5 megabit per second to 10 million customers. And I look at that and I go, wait a minute, that's, that's not right. But then I have other people. And, and actually, I would add your voice in this crowd who say, well, that happened in the past. And yeah, you have to deal with that. That was a bad thing. But now we need to move forward. What do you want to see out of the next generation of <clears throat> telecommunications network? And, and I get that. I understand that. And this is why I, you know, I respect the fact that you're saying you've got to look at both sides. I want faster speeds. I want them to invest in the next generation network. But for me, we've been trying the carrot approach for 30 years and it hasn't worked. And I'm thinking it's time for stick. Yep. And I, I'm going to add a little bit to this. The unfortunate thing, it hasn't really made the press. These large carriers, especially the tier ones, have gotten some really sweetheart deals on right of way for fiber. Pipelines, train tracks, high tension lines. There's a whole heck of a lot of sweetheart deals that the federal government gave these carriers for right of way. And so on this particular point of net neutrality, I actually will flip over and say, shame on the carriers. They posted some record profits and didn't deliver. So I'm going to flip flop back and forth depending on what portion of net neutrality we're going to talk about. Yeah, I sure as heck want higher speeds. Um, and I'm willing to pay for them, but the carriers really didn't give us a good deal. And I think, yeah, maybe it is time for the federal government to go and shake things up, keep them honest, and maybe in 10 years time or something like that, we can back off a little bit. Yeah, uh, I'm thinking uh, specifically of the uh, the Cable Communications Act. And this, this falls into your point, which cut through all the red tape so that cable industries, Comcast, Time Warner, Cox, etc., would have an incredibly easy time of getting right of way to lay down copper, lay down uh, coax for their networks. Now, they were given that with the understanding in the agreement that they would put their networks at the benefit of the communities that they served. But the language was so vague that there was really no way to to enforce that. It was sort of, now, hey, people, we're going to give you this nice thing here, and we know you're going to make a lot of money off of it, but you promise us that you're going to look after the community that you're installing it for. That never materialized, and there's no way to enforce that. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, this right of way is something that it kills any company trying to enter the field. No one can come in, unless you're a Google and you have billions of dollars to burn, and lay fiber or coax because the incumbents are going to make it so difficult for you to do it. We, we, have a, we had a story here. The, the CEO of Sonic.net was telling us of how difficult it is for him to run fiber in San Francisco. It will literally cost him $5,000 per house, not per pole, but per house he passes. Not installs to, but goes past because AT&T and Verizon will use every possible legal maneuver against him before he can lay that fiber and it just it strikes me as that's just that's bad faith bargaining um so while i feel for them that title two is gonna it's just gonna be it's gonna be a mess uh, i i think it's gonna be less of a mess than it is right now uh, and here i go flip-flopping again so Long time ago, I'll tell you a story. I was actually on this group of, with this group of people. We called ourselves the Coalition for Competitive Telecommunications. I heard some of the very same arguments. And what we were seeking to do was deregulate intralata communications 
for Hawaii, that meant inter-island. Um, it was, you know, inter, it was actually more expensive to call an outer island than it was to call the mainland. So we went, we did a lot of lobbying. We, in front of the Public Utilities Commission and then eventually in the uh, legislature and managed to get the intralata telecommunications market deregulated a year before the feds did it. Didn't make us real popular. In fact, the whole group was um, pr declared persona non grata and barred from the uh, major telecommunications carrier building for several years. But I heard from some of the bigwigs that were involved in that and said it was actually the best thing that could have happened to them. By deregulating it, uh, it threw open the market, created all kinds of new services that were never available before. And that particular large carrier posted record profits within five years after deregulation. So... I'm sorry, I flip flop back and forth because it's not one consistent story. It's lots of little stories and different portions of what Title II is going to do, what net neutrality is going to do. It really depends on what market segment we're talking about. But Hubert, I, I think that flip flopping is absolutely essential for, for this. And this is why we're talking about it like this, which is it is a complex issue. You cannot just say, oh, corporations bad or government bad. There are stories that go up and down the gamut here that you can bring out, and I, I'm guilty of this. I bring out old hurts. Like, for example, I still can't believe how long it took for the government to act and say, yeah, you can plug in your phone to the phone system. Remember, for the longest time, it was impossible. You, it was illegal for you to plug your own device into the, the phone system. You had to rent a device from, uh, from AT&T. And hey, try selling lease line modems in the regulated days. I couldn't. used to sell Motorola and Codex. Yeah. I mean, the internet as we know it, because it grew out of modems, would not exist if the government had not stepped in and said, no, this is bad. You cannot do this. Uh, and and I'm, kind of, I'm kind of at that stage again. I'm, I'm thinking we've got promise here and we've got something that could be incredible. But if the corporations aren't doing what they should be doing, then is, does, does that mean that we now have to take this lesser evil? Yeah, it's probably going to be, let's go and nudge them in the right direction, you know, beat them over the head with a stick for a little while, get them to play nice, and back away. You know, the, it, you know, the breaking up of the Ma Bell, you know, the big, big bell, um, that was one heck of a stick. But it sure made life a lot more interesting and opened up the market. And for a little while, it was really, really, really painful. But I think once we get past the pain, I think it'll be good. I'm hoping market pressures combined with some new government regulations will actually make the market better and see a renaissance in Internet capability, Internet um, products, Internet services. Um, only time will tell. My crystal ball is as clear or cloudy as anyone else's. Uh, I just wish Tom Wheeler the very best, it's but I hope that job. man has some really, really thick skin. Yeah, and not only that, um, I I offer them. I need to give the man an apology because I thought, oh gosh, here's a cable company lackey. He's coming into this job, and at first it looked like he was doing that, but now it's you. You look at what he's what he's been saying, and you're like, okay, this man's ready for a fight. <clears throat> I I, I got to respect that, but I, I, I'm with you. When Ma Bell was first broken up, you heard a lot of the same grumbling and griping that you're hearing right now, that there's this threat of the of Title II, uh, that this is going to destroy investment. In fact, they, I mean, you could bring up articles and news clips. It's going to destroy investment. Nobody's going to invest in infrastructure if you do this. No, no player is big enough to, to get the kind of innovation that Ma Bell could do. And ultimately, even though, as you said, it was incredibly painful for a couple of years, the system that we have today, the internet that we have today, would not exist if Ma Bell hadn't been smashed. And even though it reformed like the Terminator, uh, I, I think that was still progress. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah, uh, no arguments here. Um, I'm actually reading J.J. Toth's uh, little rant. He keeps asking about how is P2P illegal? 
kind of off topic, dude, but person to person, depending on which um, definition you use, isn't illegal. It's just discouraged. Uh, so if you take it in the telecommunications world, anyway, we're really off topic here. But net neutrality does have kind of an interesting side effect in that in theory, this is theory now, just Chebert speculating, small systems like what I think you're alluding to for person to person, so you can, it's, it would be easier to set up small systems, especially for like rural communities might be easier. It might level the playing field. The only hassle is things like, say for instance, like frequencies um, auctions are going to keep the small guys out because it's really expensive. But if you wanted to go and lay your own fiber in a small community, I think net neutrality has the potential for making that easier because it's the stick. It's going to keep the AT&Ts and Verizons from throwing up quite as many roadblocks to uh, doing pole attachments. You know, Google said, yeah, pole attachments is a real big deal and that they, they want Title II to make it easier for them to get pole attachments. Um, we shall see. I'm not sure how it's actually going to be implemented. And uh, sorry, guy, that's about as close to direct an answer I'm going to give you. I'm not sure. Was he? I'm not sure if he was talking about that or if he was talking about peer-to-peer -peer, uh, file transfers, which again, it's it are not illegal. Uh, but yeah, yeah. It, I mean, if the if, if the data <laughs> that you're downloading is copyrighted, then that is illegal. But no, yeah. it's it, the technology itself is not. Uh, Cheaper, uh, let's let's push forward a tiny little bit and address sure. the question directly. If you had to define what net neutrality means, having already discussed how the internet works, how peering works, how ISPs have tiers, uh, how ISPs get paid, what would you say net neutrality means? If someone says, I want a neutral net, what are they saying to you? Uh, they are, in my mind, saying they want a completely neutral net one, I don't think they really understand what they want because uh, they don't understand the telecommunications business. But I think what they are wanting is no special deals. Uh, if that's you know one statement, it's no special deals. So that means the personal relationships between router geeks has to become more transparent. You can't just whip open your cell phone and say, hey, Joe Friday, um, I've got a high priority video conference. Can you temporarily add a special route into your routing tables to reroute me over the past the slow link just so for say today? That kind of stuff's going to disappear. Um, it's also going to change how much profit uh, each of the different internet service providers providers are going to make. So unfortunately, on the bad side, it's probably going to make your internet connection more expensive. Now, on the good side, because of what the um, White House has done and so forth, redefining things, your speeds are going to be faster, but I think you're going to pay more for them. Um, it's Anyone that asks me what net, net neutrality is, is, I call net neutrality a double-edged sword. It's going to have some good effects. It's going to have some bad effects. And now, you know, if it stays, we're just going to have to live with it. You're going to have to say, hey, take the good with the bad. And hopefully in a year or two or three or four, it'll get better. And new markets will emerge. New services will emerge. Um, I'm going to be more optimistic about it. I think net neutrality is a good thing. But I think there's going to be some bitter medicine to go with it. Net neutrality, it gets better. Uh, Chiever, let, let's wander away from the topic a little bit because I want to go through uh, to something a little bit more cheery and something that does, that's not going to bring us down quite so much. So instead of talking about a neutral net and uh, the different ramifications that it may have for us and our future Internet, instead, why don't we go ahead and laugh at FedEx? 
All right, so here's something a little strange. I needed to send back a package of one of the parts for my quadcopter build broke. And uh, so I needed to log into my FedEx account. I, I always forget what it is. I kind of know what the username and password will be, but it rotates. So I fail normally a couple of times. But anyways, I, I went again and went to the FedEx website and I logged in like so, um, like you do, North America. And uh, I know that my my password is, I mean, my username is going to be Blackrobe. It's, it's one of the things I use. I, I kind of forgot the password, but then um, I used one of the ones that I rotate through, and it went here. Now, this is strange because this is not me. This actually belongs to a different company. Uh, if you take a look at the, at the profile here, this belongs to a company in New York by the name of Black Robe Capital. Obviously, I am not Black Robe Capital. Uh, and so I'm kind of wondering why in the world I'm seeing their site. And it has all their billing information. It has all their contact information. Now, you might be saying, okay, well, maybe that's just that's just weird. You entered in the wrong username and the wrong password. But this is them. Um, I'm probably going to get in trouble for showing this, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and do it anyways. Now, uh, let's go ahead and open up a different browser. So I'm going to open up uh, IE just so we can have them side by side. I don't want to use a uh, incognito mode because people might cry foul. Uh, I'm going to go to FedEx again. So for a while, I thought maybe their servers were messed up and uh, it it uh, sent me to the wrong place. But then I remembered, no, 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 that's right. I capitalize my username. So I use Blackrobe with a capital B. And um, I go ahead and use the exact same password that I did last time. And now this is me. This is actually my account. So now you're seeing who I am. And if I go to the uh, the, the manage account, it, it shows you my profile. Uh, so the strange thing is that we would both have the same password. It's a very unique password. It's a set, It's an alphanumeric one, completely random. And yet I have it and they have it. Kind of shocked. Don't know what that means, but... Uh, Hopefully, it's something that's just a glitch. I've been holding on to that for a while because I, I, I actually did submit it to FedEx. It it was a glitch on the FedEx side. And the way it was explained to me was they had done a database update. Uh, and I guess accounts that had the same password were not checked for capitalization in the username. or so the, I, I mean, it, it sounded like a really, really fishy explanation but what it sounded like was they had a bad piece of code that wasn't sanitizing inputs but uh, it was interesting because I tried it on three other accounts and it actually worked so I don't know Chibert, uh you have a FedEx account right yeah I certainly do maybe it's time for me to pay it a visit <laughs> go right ahead it's got no money in it damn <laughs> all right there we go <clears throat> Brian Chi um, from the direct, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. I want to thank you so very much for being on this episode of Padres Corner. Uh, thanks, Padres. I, I love working with you. You know that. I love having you on This Week in Enterprise Tech. You've been on Before You Buy Now, and you've been on Padres Corner a few times. So uh, you, you're a regular fixture for the Twit TV Army. But for those people who may be seeing you for the first time, could you please tell them where they might be able to find you on the Internet? <clears throat> Well, actually, the easiest place is right in my bottom third, A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B. It's at Advanced Net Lab, and it's my Twitter handle. Um, I try to do a real good job of answering anyone's questions. Um, if you post something that's really, really cool, I'll retweet it, just like the Snorgy. Hey, hey. <clears throat> I'm also really big on 3D printing. Uh, I think 3D printing is going to change the world, and I'm going to do everything I can to help it along. Uh, they can also find you on the SOST website, right? Yes. Uh, I am part of the University of Hawaii School of Ocean, Earth Sciences, and Technology. So that's www.soest.hawaii.edu. And I'm actually listed under Resources. And it's the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory. If you are really interested and you want to go and peep on some underwater beasties, you can go to the 
Aloha Cabled Observatory Site, which is aloha, A-L-O-H-A dot Manoa, M-A-N-O-A dot Hawaii dot edu. If you click on the little icon on the left side, live links, you can go and watch the streaming video and listen to whales live, and you can watch the goofy beasties go past the cameras. Yeah, if you ever wanted to see what the ocean looks like a couple miles down, you, you got to drop in. Once yeah, again, that stuff sprinkling down, Yeah, that's... That's fish poop. Well, I mean, it's got to go someplace. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Chief, we're going to have you back on real soon. Until then, aloha. Get yourself some rest. Thanks, dude. Take care, everybody. Now, folks, that's the end of this episode of Padres Corner. But remember that you can always get every episode of Padres Corner by going to our show page at twit.tv slash padre. While you're there, you'll also be able to get our links if there's a story that you wanted to check out for yourself, as well as a drop-down menu so that you can get Padres Corner automatically downloaded into your device of choice. No matter if it's an iPhone, an Android, a Zune, a laptop, a desktop, a Mac, a PC, we've got something for you. Also, don't forget that you can find me on Twitter. It's probably the best way to find out what I'm doing and what I'm playing with. Just go to twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. And you'll find what I'm doing when I'm not doing Twit. Not only will I give you updates on who our guests are and what our topics will be, but you'll see what I do for fun. Now, if you really want to follow me, you'll follow all the shows I do on the Twit TV network. Right now, that means I do This Week in Enterprise Tech with Chebert on Mondays at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. That's going to change in March to 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific on Fridays. On Tuesdays, I'm here for Padres Corner at 7.30 Pacific, which, again in March, will change to Fridays at 5 o'clock p.m. On Thursdays, right now, you'll find me twice, once for Know How at 11 o'clock a.m. Pacific time and uh, once at 1.30 p.m. for Coding 101, which will be switching to Monday in Twyatt's old slot just go to twit.tv slash Cal. You'll find all the changes there. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, to Lisa and Leo for letting me keep the lights on, for the engineers for making such a, an awesome setup that is easy enough for me to manipulate, and most of all, to you. Because without an audience, we don't have Padres Corner. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit. This has been Padres Corner, and you come out sane on the other side. <laughs>